So I'm joined here today with Devious Grunt Alliance, the owner of the channel at least. You looks like to get Devious Grunt as well. Uh, why don't you say hello? Let the people know who you are. What's up, guys? This is Devious Grunt of Devious Grunt Alliance. Uh, thank you, Kevin, again for having me on the show and ready to talk about HTS Kansas City. Hey, we had, a, had you on last time to kind of discuss the events that happened at Raleigh, which was pretty interesting. Was it Raleigh or was it Anaheim? I don't know. It was Anaheim that we talked about Anaheim, last time. Yeah. yeah. Raleigh yeah. was a little prelude, but mm -hmm. we got Anaheim out of the way. Now we're at Kansas City, which is yeah. an amazing event. Yeah, I was there at the event. It was a ton of fun. I got my first time going out, seeing all like my Halo buddies from like, gosh, probably over two years yeah. ago. Pretty much the last one. Got some pictures. Yeah, yeah the last yeah. event I went to was uh, the Anaheim 2020 event. For Halo Reach, and uh, yeah, then the pandemic Kevin and everything shut down. So I haven't seen a lot of you guys since like two, maybe even three years, probably from a lot of people out there. If you if you ever get a chance to go to a HCS event, absolutely do it. If you have any friends in the Halo community, try to coordinate something. Go do it. Trust me, it's a lot of fun. But we're talking about future events at the end of this video as well. But uh, Divas Grunt, I wanted to bring him on because he's kind of like an analyst of. Halo HCS. He's even actually worked the last two events virtually, correct? Yeah, I did all of the gameplay clipping, so I would watch every stream. That's both A, B, C, and D. And I also did some work with some of the photos as well. But I did that for the last two tournaments, so I think, like, just broadly speaking, I probably have seen the most tournament footage out of, like, any living person, <laughs> unless they went out of their way to actually see them themselves. But... I would absolutely believe that. And I even would even believe that before you started virtually working for these tournaments as well, because you're kind of known for doing clip highlights on your channel when it comes to these events. You, you, catch, you capture everything. And you do a great yeah, job gotta of doing make it, too. Gotta make sure I get every uh, viable clip, you know, for mm -hmm. people to see. That's right. good out there. All right, guys, this is Kevin from the future. Now, after we record this video, literally like a day or two after we were done recording this session, Spartan came up with the big news that he's benching himself. And so we kind of wanted to get a little bit of a segment talking about this as well, because this is basically the biggest news happening within HCS. EPS Grunt goes into what examples could happen with a benched Spartan and what could happen out in the future. This is a segment from his full video. If you guys want to check it out, Check out his channel again, linked in the pinned comment down below. And to cover the Spartan situation in recent events, I do think there are four possibilities of happening. One, the organization that E United is currently in talks with, which, you know, if this is even true, actually agrees on the Spartan trade. And if that's the case, you could very well be seeing what I think is likely to be a phase Spartan. Two, E United accepts Spartan's demands to bench Ryanoob and find a replacement player from another roster. And that player, I could see numerous options for. I really don't think you need a carbon copy of Ryanoob's playstyle to make E United work. However, what Ryanoob does bring to E United is his leadership and communication qualities, which I do think is preferred for this player. And based on prior history, I think that Pistola would actually be a brilliant fit here. And I don't know how that trade would go in terms of contracts, if it would be smooth or not, but this is something that I could see very likely happening if this scenario played out. And also with Ryan's recent birth of his daughter, which congratulations to Ryanu by the way, this could inadvertently give more time for a benched Ryanu to spend more time with his newborn daughter. Three, Spartan remains on the bench, E United refuses to trade or accept any buyout offers, and he unfortunately sits out for the rest of the season. And four, which I still think is possible, the team just makes amends and they just go back to how they were before. Which, albeit likely not to happen, I still think is possible. I do think at this time, it's really sort of unpredictable to see what's going to actually happen here. But at the end of the day, I really, really hope we get to see Spartan once again on land this year. I think it would be a huge loss if we had one of the biggest superstars of this year have to sit out for the rest of the competition. That's just terrible for competition and it's just something that really no one wants to see. So I think let's dive into some of the uh, topics to dive in, to jump into here for the first one. So the first one I'll talk about is kind of like your expectations for the event, right? For the team wise, right? I think uh, like kind of going into like, what were your favorite team to like win everything or what were you kind of like hoping for some other teams and stuff like that going into HES Kansas City? Yeah, so going in, I think mostly everyone, there's obviously you have super fans of certain teams, but Mostly everyone thought either Optic or Cloud9 were gonna win. More so Optic because Optic looks so good online in the phase invitational and just all the scrims, they're just completely dominating everyone. And for me, I thought I had my money in Cloud9. I thought there was a chance that Optic could win too, 
But really, when I thought about the top teams that could win the tournament, those were the only two that came to mind. And it's true, everyone really forgot about Sentinels, which I guess we'll kind of get to. But I thought there was a chance that Sentinels would find their form, but I didn't, I didn't think it would happen this tournament. Yeah, they really showed up on Sunday. They even, they almost like lost against um, was it L J Quadrant. Quadrant? Yeah, which two, actually two teams showed up. The really good, La Latam team, the Pittsburgh Knights, and Quadrant. It was two teams who went to Game Five of Sentinels. It was yeah. crazy. Yeah, they were a sleeping giant for sure. This event, I was definitely expecting to see Optic to win, mainly because I'm, I'm a bit of an Optic. I'm, I'm a fan of the team, right? Like I like Lucid, I like Trippy, APG, right. Informal as well. They're like they're fun to watch. Especially Lou said, like, he, like watching him play is kind of almost like a treat almost. You're like, oh, so that's yeah, how dude. Halo Infinite's played. <laughs> I'm know? so glad how, I guess, popular Lou said has gotten because I remember seeing him when he first popped up in like mid Halo 5 and mm -hmm. I was like, this guy is like a really good player. Like, he's really cool. We're like really underrated. And now he's like one of the top, like, just spotlight players. Like, not even popularity, but just skill wise too. He's still arguably like the best player in the game. So it's great to see Lou said just be on that sort of like just spotlight that he's in right now. It's really cool. Yeah, like, but it's just crazy. I like they, they, I thought finished it. They, they got pretty close. They finished like close third, I would say, in the tournament. Like, yeah, and like people are gonna say that like, oh, that was a downgrade from last tournament because they got second with Pistola. Well, they didn't have Sentinels that came up in Championship Sunday at that last tournament yeah. on Anaheim. So, I would argue that that tournament they would probably would have gotten third as well. So I think um, this time. You know, there were a few factors that went into play. If you didn't see uh, Optic Formal, he actually uploaded, uh, it was like a co-host like podcast with Maniac and Hitch. They uploaded a podcast talking about the event. And Formal was really like distraught about it. I've never seen him be so passionate about a loss. Mm -hmm. And he could tell like, mostly it was just Sentinels that turned up. Tur Sentinels just turned up on Sunday for what apparent reason. A team like Sentinels is known for pulling out a win at the very last second, no matter what. If you think they're out of the tournament, out of the game, just like in the Quadrant series, they come back at the very last second and they win. That's just that's just something they do. They know how to clutch up, and that's why they're that's why these players are some of the best players, if not the best players in the world. I'm glad. I was actually really glad to see Sentinels come away with the win, just because I was, I didn't want, I didn't want to see another MCC you know pro series. I didn't want to see another like Halo Five thing where basically it was like one or two teams winning the whole thing. I like to see a little variety. I like to see some competition. I'm glad to see that Sentinels were able to pull off the win. I saw this Reddit post and it was sort of like a heartfelt sort of reasoning of why Sentinels played so well on Sunday. And it could be just pure BS, but I thought it was like kind of a cool way to think of it. Is Sentinels played the way they did on Sunday as if they were playing to not drop lethal. And on Saturday, they looked very beatable. They very easily could, could have gone down to losers just for against that quadrant matchup, you know? These players, they have the talent and they just turned up Sunday. And I think having that mentality, especially going off the momentum of that Cloud9 series, they just beat them three to one. That's what won them the tournament at the end of the day. I was actually kind of shook when I was like watching them play. And then I heard like the announcers talking about like questioning Lethal and his ability in Halo Infinite kind of thing. I'm like, I, like, I, didn't, know, I didn't know this was a thing. <laughs> it was a little bit too much. I think, you know, sometimes I just want to maybe make a guess that casters have like these notes of like what to refer to for each team to bring up during like just talking about teams. And that one about lethal is probably one they bring up constantly. And like it, it was a valid point. He's definitely like not the player he used to be back in Halo 5. It's hard to kind of like judge that because I think there are more defined roles in this game more than ever. But I, I, I do think they're a little bit too harsh and lethal. I would say like the questioning lethal, I feel like it's been a thing since like they went to the, they went from Halo 5 right. to MCC. And I mean, I haven't really seen any questionable moves or plays or, you know, maybe he might not be the star player on Sentinels, but he's surrounded by Royal 2, Snakebite, and Frosty. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, people, anybody gets overshadowed when you those that kind of talent on your team. People always dog on the KD. That's, like, the first thing that a lot of people just go to. But in this sort of era of, like, team combinations, Lethal's a player that kind of just creates opportunities for his players to thrive in. All three of these other players sort of revolve around how Lethal plays. Uh, again, like, Royal 2, Frosty, and Snakebite, they kind of get the spotlight just in terms of, like, footage. But I guarantee Lethal is making those clutch moments. In fact, there are a few of them I especially saw against Cloud9 
that Lethal made some really clutch moments to literally win them games. And I saw, I think they mentioned a stat, I can't remember exactly what the number is, but I think it's like, they stated like, if Lethal gets like 10 or 15 kills in a match, their win percentage right. is like 90% <laughs> or something like that. So basically, if Lethal does well, the whole team does well. Glad to see that they kind of help sort of solidify the team, go like, no, they're still a championship quality team. You know, they just needed to get there a little, you know, they have had a little bit of a rocky road to get to where they got to uh, for Kansas City. And I think that's all that it is. Honestly, I could see a world where Sentinels wins the rest of the year now. Before this event, Cloud9 and Optic look really supremely above everyone else. You saw in that phase invitational, which Cloud9 and Optic were really the big two juggernauts at the event. So I was really surprised by Sentinels performance at this event. And for how much they like just sort of clicked and turned up in that one day, mm -hmm. that showed me enough for like, I, I just sat there and I was like, you know what, like these guys could probably win the rest of the year. And there's only two more events, really. There's Orlando and Worlds. Um, I think next thing we can probably just touch on then is the All-Star event that happened. There's a new kind of thing that we've had. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think this funny. might be a callback back for the South by Southwest event. If I remember correctly, they did a bit of an All-Star draft kind of thing. Smackdown versus Lethal. One, yeah, or? that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this time it was Team Lucid versus Renegade. Since you got a chance to actually sit down and watch the event, what were your thoughts on it? Do you think it's something that would be worth continuing on when it comes to different kind of events for these majors. Yeah, I love those little side events, whether it's like just a rivalry or just some sort of player draft. At Raleigh, they had the BTP Bonanza. Like that was yeah. super fun to watch. That was really fun um, to watch. I, I like that a lot. I love the little side events, especially if they happen like on Friday before like competition gets intense. And I think that's fun for the viewer to see too, especially in that Lucid and Renegade matchup, you saw some players team together in sort of a combination you wouldn't expect. And it was just really cool to see that 1v1 especially. I think that 1v1 tour, uh, like that 1v1 match was just uh, <laughs> sort of like a calling of what a lot of people want to see. Like yeah. I would love to see like a 1v1 tournament and some sort of competition on LAN. I think that'd be really entertaining. Whether or not like it's like indicative of skill, I think it's just a fun competition to watch. Let's say since like Lucid and Renegade are basically interchangeable best player yeah. in the game right now too. So and I think there's some other names up there now too for best player in the game. It's kind of hard to determine that, but Lucid and Renegade are definitely the headliners right mm -hmm. now, I'd say. You know, with the new mode, Last Bar and Standing coming in, I think it'd be kind of fun to see like maybe for the Orlando event, if they do like a Last Bar oh. and Standing with pro They're players. Probably do that. That They're would be actually kind of sweet to watch. I would actually really like yeah. it because like, just like the, the way the game mode is set up by itself, it has such a mm. huge crescendo at the end, right? Where I think it'd be the matches are relatively fast, you know. You probably finish a match within like what 15 minutes or something like that, so it's not too, super long. But the All Star event, like it was cool, like I, but like it just to me, it just kind of seemed like more pro Halo play, and didn't really yeah. seem like much of a variation compared to like what we had with that BTB event, which you know kind of like puts these pro players kind of like out of their element a little bit and playing some like more casual kind of wacky modes and stuff like that, like in BTB and stuff. So um, I think. Doing Last Born Sanity would be really cool. You know, Tashi, you better be watching this. No. <laughs> but <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I think that'd be sweet to have for the next event. All right, so I think well, the next one, section I want to go to is talking about uh, the most surprising and most disappointing teams. But uh, I have my teams, but I want to hear what you have to say for like the most surprising and most disappointing team. I mean, the easy answer is Sentinels for most surprising team. They mm -hmm. actually ended up winning the entire event. I'm going to try to give a different answer though. Um, from what I saw, Quadrant. Quadrant was a team that a lot of people, maybe they had top 12. I had high, I had high expectations going, going into the event. I thought Quadrant would perform very well. And they they had some of the best clips of the entire weekend. You saw that overkill by Chick on oh, Live Fire. It was nasty. insane. The best the I'm best sure. clip of the weekend for sure. Probably the best clip I've seen in like five years easily. And then um, his teammate got an overkill right after that too. There's two yeah. team wise back to back. It was awesome. Back to back overkills, Chick and SLG, that was sick. And they played so well, they almost knocked out Sentinels on yeah. Saturday. Yeah, Game by five. far it, it's it's quadrant by far. I think like runner ups ascend. Mm -hmm. It's the other EU team, the top EU team. They both got top eight. And I think doing that alone with how much competition we have with NA right now, just all the teams that were there, super impressive. And I think Quadrant is a team that a lot of people did not have in their top eight. I would, I would agree with, with both those teams, honestly. Like I either say Ascend or Quadrant. I mean, they both tied for seventh slash eighth place, I think, overall, which I, uh, I did see Tashi say that this was the first time the two EU teams finished top eight at like a Halo event. Which is awesome to see that like these competitive elements of Halo are starting to branch out beyond just like US basically. Uh, most disappointing team, I think by far. I'll, I'll give two, um, but I think by far the first one is Navi. 
mm -hmm. which was uh, they, they got second place in the EU Super leading to this event, and they didn't win. I want to say they won a map, but I don't even know if they won a map this entire tournament. They, w they definitely lost every single series. I know that for a fact. They got like 21st to 24th. The caliber of players on that team, I I'm just going with the precedent of these players because they used to be three fourths of that team infused roster from Halo 5, which was the best European team. They just really fell flat. And I, I really don't know what happened exactly, especially since they got top eight at Raleigh, which is the last international event they came at. So I think Navi was definitely a surprise, a disappointment, and just in terms of they placed. And, and they know that too. I, I wouldn't be surprised if the team just completely changed or just there was a rotation of some some kind in that team. Yeah, that's one of the things like, do you think it's gonna be like, they need to do some roster changes or they just need to kind of practice more and just kind of figure out what, you know, learn from their mistakes kind of thing from Kansas City. I think at this point, probably looking at a roster change, I think um, they've kind of run this course with this team and getting 21st to 24th is going to lead a bad taste in any team's mouth. So I think um, switching things up, at least even if it's just one player, uh, will probably make a better difference. So do you think maybe we could see Ascend or Quadrant players move over to Navi? Since Navi is a partner team, there's a lot of benefits with it. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I don't think so, just for the caliber of orgs that Quadrant and um, Ascend already are. Dude, I gotta say, oh. being at the event, whenever KCP mm. was playing, the energy was oh, wow. like, it was up to 10. It was, and it's, was awesome so being around that. Too. You wouldn't ex like you would expect in sports for the home team to have such a large crowd, but yeah. I wouldn't have expected a video game crowd to have that much of a support for like the home team. And yeah. that's just it was really cool, a really cool surprise too. Seeing yeah, the that crowd energy. was like going crazy on just like simple like battle rifle like one v one kills. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. And if they got away, yeah. you would hear it throughout the entire venue, like oh KCP one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, dude. And some like uh, even like the side stations too. Like I wish I was there to see it. I guess the next thing I want to talk about here is, um, do you feel like Optic underperformed as well? You and I kind of had them as the favorite going into this. Finishing third, mm -hmm. it was a close third, but um, I don't know, there were like some kind of, I feel like there were some kind of questionable plays that were made on Optic side, I think, especially during like that Cloud9 match, right? Where I remember like this one play where Formal like did like a grapple shot and tried to sling himself out into like right, the middle right. of the map, like bottom mid to get, like clean up a kill when it was like 48, that was 48. Actually that was actually Game 5 in Sentinels. And oh, Game 5 Sentinels, okay, that's what it was. It actually all ties in, though, exactly that. Mm -hmm. I think um, they sort of got mentally checked um, mm -hmm. as formal like the coin. If you look back at the podcast, literally that no scope by Royal 2 with the shock rifle when Formo had a camel sword just That's completely it. demoralized their whole setup. Actually, even losing that game four, that game four oddball was so pivotal. They had it in their hands. Mm -hmm. Formo even said the way that Sentinels were playing that game, it was almost as if they had given up and were giving them the win. And for some whatever reason, Optic just lost one set of fight, one set of fights at the very end. And that really literally determined possibly the entire tournament they lost the game four game five uh they got the crazy no scope and formal he was kind of out of it he went like 0 and 10 0 and 11 for yeah, he the was majority struggling. of the game a couple of those games which, he was struggling pretty hard he spoke about that he was literally struggling he spoke about that he was really upset about that the players on cloud nine the players on sentinels they have that mentality where they'll make the right decision even if it's like down to the wire down to the last second they'll make the right play and mm -hmm. that's something i noticed with some of the uh, members in optic were when it gets to crunch time, they don't always make the right decisions, and it's really like it's really tough to do that sort of stuff. And it's tough because Formo, he he, the way he described it is that if you play this event like ten times, like they would win most of it. And I would agree, like they would probably win at least a handful. Um, I think it's hard to sort of juggle Cloud9 and Sentinels to see. Like Sentinels kind of came out of nowhere. Like you didn't really expect them to be that team this event. And you have these three juggernauts and who knows, there might be some other teams thrown in the mix. Maybe e United, FaZe can make a comeback. I think that um, just having that experience, that first event experience of uh, playing Sentinels and Cloud9 this first event is great moving forward because he's going to know the level of intensity he needs to bring it up. Optus got to figure out their leadership. They got to figure out um, you know, when things get tense, like what the call, the, what the play calls are. Um, but they definitely have the talent. They definitely have the talent to win. I think next topic I want to talk about here, just real quick. The HCS Creeper made it to the main stage. 
I I'm quite happy about that. <laughs> I, I don't think I saw the creeper too much in the background. No? Oh, he was definitely there. Um, he was definitely there. I saw him on the desk at the very end, mm. but perhaps I've been so used to seeing the creeper that I just sort of like saw it as a normal sight. I <laughs> yeah, just right. completely just blocked it out. But you're probably just heads probably down that. clipping everything, you know? <laughs> I was doing that too. Actually, during each of the downtime during the matches, I was straight clipping. I had to have everything organized in folders for the editors to use. So that's a possibility too. I didn't really think about that. It was kind of awesome to watch when I was like they would have like you know pre-rolls of like some of the more important matches going on and then like I was like oh that clip happened earlier today and they put it in, like in an edit right away like that's yeah pretty awesome to have that fast turnaround mm -hmm. but it was so cool to see the creeper on the desk <laughs> it was so cool at the very end I think like right before the finals or like elimination final they had uh, yeah. a little HDS creeper in the desk so that, that was real cool they did that I did I did run into the creeper I snagged a pick with him as well so oh yeah a, you know check that off the halo bucket list Get a selfie with the Halo, with the HCS Creeper. But yeah, you know, Mr. Devious Grunt, I think that's about all we have to, to chat about for Halo greatness uh, for the competitive side of things. Next time we've got something cool to talk about when it comes to uh, competitive Halo, make sure to have you on the channel here to chat more HCS greatness and uh, see what happens in the future. Thank you so much for having me, Kevin, and I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, give it a thumbs up if you liked it, and please subscribe to Kevin Kulix. And so go subscribe to DV Threat. Link in the uh, description and also pinned comment down below. You definitely want to follow. If you like anything competitive Halo related, give him a follow. He does great, you know, highlight videos, also some good analytical videos with some excellent graphics, I will say. But, you know, kind of put me to shame over here. <laughs> oh, you do one video a day, so I think you got me drunk. <laughs> yeah, and guys, thank you so much for watching. Greatly appreciate it. Make sure to subscribe to Devious Grand Alliance, and I will catch you all in the next video. Peace out. Yeah.